Hi, <laughs> everyone. Hi, Frank. I'd like to extend a, a warm welcome for those of you joining us from the comfort of your lockdown couch or chair, um, or to those of you watching this later. Uh, like you, I'm looking forward to an engaging and thought-provoking discussion today. Uh, my name is Joshua Parker. I'm a UX analyst and project manager working with Experience Dynamics. I'm very pleased to introduce Frank Spillers, who will be leading today's webinar, Designing During Times of Pandemics, How During COVID-19 You Can Spark Resourcefulness. Frank has a background in cognitive science and has worked for more than two decades in the field of user experience. He founded Experience Dynamics in 20, uh, 2001 and is an internationally recognized leader in the field of UX consulting and training. Uh, just a quick note, uh, we're going to be using the whole 60 minutes for the webinar, but we'll keep going afterwards if there are any questions. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Frank. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing insights uh, about how we can adjust to these new circumstances and look to the future. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, thanks for that great intro and welcome to those of you uh, joining. And if you're watching this later, which I'm sure many people will be, I'm hoping that in this next 30 minutes, I can provide you some kind of background inspiration for these unusual times. This is kind of an unusual type of webinar. And I'd like to, you know, one of the reasons I put this webinar together is, is to check in with you. Um, are you like experiencing this COVID-19 the way that I am? And that's initially why I, I put this together. I think a lot of designers and there are lots of designers on this call and I don't use the term UX designer because I think all designers maybe think the way that I'm thinking just now, I'm hoping. And, uh, and, and those of you who support designers or work with them or use design or use user experience strategy in your work, in the last half of this webinar, I'd like to share with you some tools, specifically eight tools that you can use in your work, maybe now, definitely uh, when we come back to a post-COVID type of situation. So uh, we've got some fun stuff here and I think uh, we can get over the rainbow <laughs> with uh, what we're trying to do here. Let's go ahead and um, dive right in. So I say designer thinking, by the way, I don't say designed thinking. Design thinking is a methodology for bringing products and, and uh, innovations to life. Uh, but uh, I use the term designer thinking because I think designers might observe things differently. You know, I ran into Richard Saul Worman when I first got started in 1999 with kind of professional work, my very first kind of professional job in UX. And I ran across, across this quote. And if you don't know Richard Saul Worman, he's the guy who actually invented TED. He's created the whole idea of technology education design was the name of this effort. Now, he goes back to the late uh, 1970s and I think even the late 60s maybe with his work in information architecture. So he called the uh, taking information and making it understandable, he called that information architecture and the field of inform information architecture, which UX used to be called, UX design used to be called that in the early 2000s. Um, what came from this guy. So, but the thing with this quote is it stopped me in my tracks. This is the extended quote if you're uh, looking for it, and it is a really lovely kind of get the wider context here. But it stopped me in my tracks. And I think the things that stop you in your tracks, the information, the headlines, whatever it is, the processes that really like, uh, cause you to be slack jawed to are the things I think that you should pay attention to. So here with COVID-19, we've got this opportunity to kind of use it to, uh, you know, at least, I don't know, <laughs> slack jawed in another way. Check out these Richard Saul Worman quotes. I've got a few to do's in here at the start just to get you actively engaged. This, this is a, a go to meeting, go to webinar and um, uh, the engagement maybe something we'll talk about a little bit later. The thing that he said is to make things understandable, you have to understand what it's like to not understand. And I've used this like way of thinking for years. And what I've noticed is 
a lot of people don't get it. You see, the trick, the problem we have is we want certainty as humans and as designers and as UX contributors. We, we want to be sure with what we're saying, but when a user is confused, or if you, if you're doing a review of a design and you're confused, like you're just like, um, hmm, what's going on here? Allow that confusion to open, L listen to that confusion, explore it, ask questions, and explore the role and function of, of emotions. You know, emotions are, are not just about creating positive emotions for customers, but negative emotions have something to teach too. There's a great book that I read many years ago called The Power of Negative Thinking, or sorry, The Power of, uh, yeah, The Power of Negative Thinking, not, not The Power of Positive Thinking, but The Power of Negative Thinking. And what that guy in there, um, Humphrey, said is he said that negative emotions are messengers. They give you, they give you message, messages of, of actions that you need to take, you know, that, that, so there's a positive benefit in negative emotions. Well, I've explored that in my work with emotion design and users and found it to be actually really true um, that you can kind of understand users' frustrations and confusions. So the question here is, is it trauma or innovation? That's what's on the menu right now with COVID-19 and we're about a month into lockdown and, you know, and I'm starting and I'm going, oh, wow, uh, what's going on with this is, you know, um, the situation, it's really weird times we're living in, right? Uh, if you look at some interesting research in post-traumatic growth that uh, Dr. Amen shared is that they found that there are three groups, like we're experiencing this trauma of COVID-19. So the first group is 10% of people will get uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Like they'll be like, oh, you know, they'll have those, those, um, uh, those, those sensations. Another 80% will return to normal and 10% will actually become stronger than they were before. And so my question or my challenge for you is, um, which of these categories do you want your story to be? You know, I think we have a choice. I mean, that woman there is one thing, but I think a lot of us are going like this right now, <laughs> right? Um, there's, here's, a, here's a question for you, just to, just to wake you up and keep you engaged here. Who's, who's feeling like photo B? Photo A was the woman going, what is going on? <laughs> and some of us are like, hmm? Right, I actually saw um, bouncers, like club, you know, nightclub bouncers are are now working at supermarkets to for the for the lines for this enforcing social distancing. All right, so um, there's there's the results of the poll, uh, <laughs> and 44% of you are ready for the challenges that COVID brings. Yeah, awesome, great to hear it. So you've come to the right webinar. <laughs> Um, that's kind of how I'm feeling too, or at least I'm choosing to feel that way. Because you know what, we don't have a lot of option, do we? What can we do? You know, and COVID is is showing us what's broken. It showed us straight away the 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 gaps, the miscalculations. You know, with our politicians of you know slow to react in some countries and some others not. But there's a need to reevaluate like everything, right? And I think that there's a need to connect with our values. You know, health is the most important thing right now on the planet, right? I think learning for me, one of the first things when lockdown occurred, I was like, what more can I learn? Learn, learn, learn. That was the thing that came to my mind. That was my reaction to this unusual situation. So I think we're all in this uh, situation together. And this is, um, you're welcome to COVID, COVID U, COVID University. Um, and this is what I say is make COVID your university, make it your opportunity to learn, to learn, learn, learn. Maybe it's UX stuff, maybe it's it's design related stuff, but maybe it's just like learning to play piano or learning to draw, you know, it's just every day is a, a chance. I mean, look at what's going on. Like this is, there are these weird paradoxes and this is kind of what I mean by designer thinking. 77,000 lives saved and as of April 20th, 40,000 deaths in China. Uh, and there's the picture before and after in uh, Wuhan uh, and, and uh, Beijing of the uh, less smog, cleaner spaces, animals just appearing in places, or, or at least we're noticing those animals, right? Uh, the intense number of papers that were published in, in a very short period of time from January to 
early March 2020, there were more papers published in that time period than in, in any other previous um, period. And of course, we have the rapid vaccination development. By March of 2020, the, the Chinese were test doing live clinical trials on their vaccines. So um, there's some exciting stuff going on. And as a user experience designer, we're always chasing broken things. This is the thing for me that's so paradoxical is we always are looking for new scenarios and new situations and finding out what's not working, paying attention to users of systems, you know, and as designers, we're noticing when, when things are broken, like we're constantly reprioritizing, you know, customer features. And so this is not an unusual way to think, you know, to be like change is constant, really. I mean, um, user experience is a disruptive kind of process in most engineering groups. They're like, oh, don't talk to your users, don't listen to your users. In many organizations, that's the normal belief system. And we're constantly fighting against the status quo. So UX work in itself is, it's not perfect. It's not really well understood in many organizations or valued, you know? So the question here, the, the big question is what's broken? What are you unprepared for? You know, what's What's going on and, and what's your plan B, you know, in, in every area of your life? I mean, for me, that was the first reflection point is like, wow, you know, there's stuff already broken. It's not just a health crisis and, a, you know, and not to diminish the health, the health um, and the uh, severity of this pandemic, but there's a lot of broken stuff already, you know, uh, homelessness, uh, environment. I mean, you can find broken stuff and then there's these weird paradoxes with, you know, I thought we were already doing social isolation with our devices, you know, this is great. This is Banksy, by the way, he, this is one of my favorite Banksy, you know, pictures, but I think this, this upheaval, this weirdness, this disruption, is it, is it like a, a pressure wall against our society that designers, it's like it provides a way for designers to, to sort of, sort of step back and go, okay, yeah, we, we can, we can, we can handle contrasts, you know, we can handle contrast because we do contrast in our design right um, it's a big visual principle is contrast you can see buttons and things like that right but then there's these historical periods and i was starting to think to myself well who else has this isn't the first time you know who else has gone through this in history and what can we learn from from that and uh you know this period of reflecting and reevaluating and reprioritizing our values, like what's important to us. Let me define designer thinking as I'm calling it. This is me just saying this is, you know, how designers maybe are interpreting this. So we pay attention to our audience and that could be specific audiences that are marginalized, you know, just users with disabilities, prisoners. I don't know if the, there are different scenarios where people are already inside trapped or that are left out of society. Like, you, if you do accessibility work, you see that all the time. So, you know, and, and then you say, say to yourself like, well, can't, shouldn't we pay attention to that too while we're fixing stuff, you know, while we're finding trillion dollar budgets, you know, that just came out of nowhere. And can we also reprioritize and, and fix the things in our world, like our society? That's kind of where my head is at with this. Of course, we pay attention to aesthetics and, and we're gonna have to start redefining that too, you know, like, um, I'm sure, and uh, intention, the intention that goes into a design, you know, making things functional. And, but we notice irregularities as designers, we notice difference, and we're not afraid of it, we were able to explore it. And, you know, we mix yellows with, you know, greens, and we mix, uh, you know, we mix, we mix um, um, negative and positive emotions, we mix good journeys and bad journeys. And, good experiences and bad, we don't, we're, we don't shy away. We don't try and keep it all alike or all a smiley face. We try and explore that. So we need to, we need to ask ourselves what's broken right now. Um, there's my hand sanitizer. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, the question of what's broken is video conferencing. We're all being forced to video conference, but hey, I really, heart goes out to the people that are teaching, you know, that kids are learning with these systems. These online education systems suck. Go to webinar, the system we're using right now sucks. Um, and, and, and what I mean by that is as in terms of an immersive, like even right now, if anyone, do I, can I see you? Can I, 
can you raise your hand? Oh, yes, you can add the raise hand button or something, but you know it's probably not going to be the same thing as in real life. I could look at your body language, see if you're sleeping, see if you're like, you know, paying attention to me right now. And um, and there are some features that there's one software on the market, I think, that does that, but it's very clunky too. It's, it starts with a capital A you know, software we all use. But um, so there's a lot of work actually. And Zoom, Zoom has a couple of features that are really great, but still we're not even there to defining this. Uh, Microsoft Research you know, created this, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is another to do is holoportation, just Google Microsoft holoportation. We need this right now. Like, where is it? You know, and of course we need more hand sanitizer. A spoiler there, because you've already run out of hand sanitizer. So that joke is a little bit past, right? Um, you know, it's the masks that we need right now, right? But, um, you know, there are things that, that are broken that are very interesting problems to kind of look at especially because now that we realize that social closeness is important and online learning is important, you know, VR is here. Is it like, where's VR? Where like VR has, you see, this is what we mean by reprioritizing and refocusing our values. VR is focused on entertainment. So you can entertain yourself to death with VR now, but can you have a virtual meeting, an immersive meeting where you teleport, you have a, this is a working prototype. The guy who created the term virtual reality, Jaron Lanier, uh, actually has been working with Microsoft and Microsoft Labs. And this is about this news is about four or five years old. Now Microsoft has the HoloLens 2 that just came out and was funded essentially by US military money that was created for the US Army. Um, but uh, where is it in terms of, you know, they have it, it's only professionals that can use it. So right now, Microsoft CEO is going around saying um, that you can add backgrounds to your Teams, you know, Teams is a collaborative software. That's it that with AI, right? AIs, we have a few AI features that are helpful like that. They're, it's a good feature, trust me. It's great, I'm glad that's being unveiled, but where where are we, you know? So I'm thinking right now at Apple, the VR teams are probably reorganizing the, remember apple is working on a vr entry and apple is not selling phones anymore really they don't make money off them maybe this is the big opportunity maybe in a couple of years or in a year or or i don't know where we may all be using apple um, social collaborative vr that we need if, especially for an extended lockdowns for long long periods of time so how about robots are robots here? I mean, what do you think? I mean, with with drone, what my point with this with robots isn't just to share these technologies. No, no. My point is to say that um, I'm going to ask you what you think right here. Is do you think this is in terms of user adoption? Robots have been around a long time. Let's say at least 10 years. VR has been around in this current phase at least five years strongly. Uh, drones, okay, they've been around, but the trust of them with humans with robots has not, you know, even video conferencing, you, the trust level, video conference has been around solid for 10 years, right? At least, I mean, solid technology, but people haven't felt comfortable. Now we're forcing everybody. So maybe this is the dawn of that. Let's see what people think here. Uh, probably for sure, 55%, <laughs> probably not 16%, <laughs> interesting. I don't know, there's some, it, these, these times of intense historical change can change user adoption. I think as UX designers or as designers or as stakeholders, which I'm I'm thinking that is the category here, that maybe this is maybe there's something here. We definitely need to start paying attention closely to these trends. And you know, this is a the, ro the robot is this the time when we get the robot delivery. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, right? Nurse robots as nursing assistants, you know. So if they're positioned in these for good, for health, is that the entry point to robots? And if robots are going to start being introduced, what else can we do? I don't know if you uh, have seen these kind of new stories about they've even, robots are now like essential and some countries are using them to, you know, because of the coronavirus uh, flu and so forth, uh, the, the catchiness of that, of that particular um, disease, you know. In, in Japan, they used, uh, um, this kind of uh, robots to help people graduate. So the Japanese, now don't jump in and think Japan is all robot, robot and super high tech. And that's, Japan's actually super low tech 
as much as it is high tech. If you've been to Japan, you know that they they still use cash. Mobile payment adoption, it, like the United States, has been very very low in, uh, in Japan compared to China, where like you know a good 60 to 80 percent of the population is pretty higher than that. Closer to 90 percent of the population in China uses QR codes and uses mobile payment. So cultural conditions vary, and you really need to pay close attention. And then there's this. I don't know if you saw this, but that someone shared this and someone corrected the, the curve here uh, from the original one. But it looks like the next 30 years are a playground of design opportunities because uh, the amount of crises that will come from uh, sustainability from Earth related issues are just lingering in the background. This is interesting, this story that came out in early April of 2020, uh, that um, you know, these things that we've seen in the news are important, are, are there, but then you go take care of nature, this, this senior scientist. Um, so and it, you, at first you go like, what's that? Right? And even they, the way they talk about it in the article and, and biodiversity is, is where these pathogens, it's no surprise that the, this particular COVID-19 comes from an animal. It's a zoo, zoo, zoo uh, morphic, I think, or that's what they call it, like it jumps from to, to humans from animals. And that's not unique. That's just the way that happens. Well, it turns out that habitat is actually one of those barriers to present, prevent it. We have some major um, issues going on uh, with our biodiversity, uh, biolog ecological sort of disaster. If you look at, I'm going to put some stats up. I'm not going to read them, but you know, you can scan them and choose your own here. Um, in Denmark, they started planting trees. I love the Danish. The, the Danish have had the most comprehensive solution towards COVID-19, one of the most comprehensive in the world. Uh, you look at them on the global resilience scale for economic resilience, and they're in the like the top three. Norway is number one um, for bounce back and for the ability for their economy to, to uh, sustain it. So it's, it's interesting that those two things are connected a little bit more on there was a huge report that was done last uh, year in 2019, and they concluded that we need transformative change. Look at the diagram, by the way. So it's not climate change that's number one. It's it's that's actually number three. It's biodiversity, what was in that previous report. And um, so a lot of the disasters that may have us working at home and change how our users get to places may be in the environment. And I think it's time we paid attention to that. I want to go to the next point here, which is um, uh, about uh, some historical disasters. And actually, I'm actually going to focus on the heroic designers here as much as, but I'll talk about some of the other failures and disasters. There's four characters I want to introduce to you briefly. I'm just going to touch upon their lives. Da Vinci, Fuller Jobs, and Fresco. Some of these you know, I'm sure, at least two of those. Maybe you don't know as much as the other two. But the thing that these guys had in common, they were great innovators. They were they, they changed the world with their brand ideas. And during their lifetimes were, and during their, in the case of, of Jobs um, and, and uh, these modern ones, Fuller and Fresco, there are these forces um, going on in, their, in the marketplace and, you know, and in the world as well um, that caused, uh, some some tension, right? And it's this it's this period that I think we want to talk about. But before we go to the four guys, uh, let's look at some of the women who changed. You know, what would we do without our screens? Catherine Blodgett invented screens. Basically, um, she was born in 1898, and during World War II. So a lot of people are are comparing COVID-19 to World War II, um, but this is where the the invention of of uh, screens came from, from this particular woman. Uh, she was working at um, uh, DuPont, I believe it was. Wi-Fi, so what would we be doing without Wi-Fi? Can you imagine this COVID-19 without screens and Wi-Fi? So Wi-Fi was created by Hedy Lamarr during World War II, and she was, she was essentially working on wireless communication technology secretly. She was an actress as well. Uh, but she she's attributed to the groundbreaking work that paved the way to uh, to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth algorithms. This woman Ada Lovelace in 1843, 
And the, the point is like, in addition to the war and the secrecy, you know, the Second World War, but in this, in this woman's case, um, women were not even allowed to own property in the United States in, in this time period, uh, let alone, you know, having their own ideas. So she pretty much rewrote the math, mathematics genius uh, Babbage's uh, analytical engine, and she's attributed to being the, the creator of algorithms. So just a little pause there for the women, women in history have, have endured so much um, isolation, if you will, social isolation, and have had to fight these huge battles, you know, that, that um, uh, you know, are also a struggle along the way. Let's talk about da Vinci for a minute. He said the noblest pleasure is the joy of understanding. There's a link there between what we saw earlier uh, from, from uh, Richard Saul Warman. But with da Vinci, he was, he actually considered himself more of a scientist. And during his time period, actually, da Vinci, uh, he, he was born in 1495. Now the plague was going on up to, the six, to 1665. He also, there was a time he was working for a, a, a king or something like that. Some, somebody invited him to his manor and there was a malaria epidemic going on and he wasn't able to create, he was redesigning, re-architecting the, the, these gardens or this, it was like some big showy project. And he wasn't actually able to do the work because of this malaria epi epidemic. Just to put it into perspective, Black Death, this plague killed 25 million uh, people and um, and then of course at the time you also had measles bubonic plague. By the way, that is what the coronavirus looks like on the right. I don't it's kind of creepy even just looking at the thing, but that is what it looks like. Um, da Vinci invented some stuff that was like three because three four hundred years ahead of its time in terms of his sketches, in terms of and this one is really freaky, the robot arm one. Um, but he, the thing with da Vinci, and you'll notice this with all of these, these guys that I'm about to share with, and we'll, we'll go to Bug Minister Fuller, is they were generalist, you know, um, that the art was a way to, to the, the art was a way for them as scientists really to, uh, to communicate and to share the things that they invented during their lifetimes. Now, Buckminster Fuller talked actually about this, and he said that he, I think he used to say specialization is for insects that specializing, the problem with specializing is you narrow, 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 and then you know everything about one thing and nothing about everything else. Well, if you look at the ancient world that, and I'm talking about ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient Egypt, and uh, the Babylonians, which is where kind of, you know, modern, uh, at least Western civilization references uh, a lot of the ideas from that period and medicine and health and all these things, they were always interdisciplinary. They were always, uh, you know, you would you would have an architect and, and a doctor, so medicine, architecture, and mathematics, astrophysics, they were blended all together. Uh, and so you see that with, here's Buckminster Fuller, right? And it's, it the, the time is 1920, right? And, um, uh, the time is 1920, and he's he's sitting at the edge. I think it was Lake Erie, and he's 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 just lost a child. His daughter died when she was young, and he had no money. He was penniless, and he was uh, thinking of killing himself. And he looked into the reflection of the lake, and he thought, "I don't have the right to kill myself. I don't have the right to have despair." because uh, I know too much and I'm too much of an, uh, an asset to, to share. So he decided to take everything that he knew, everything that, and he was a Harvard, he actually studied at Harvard and he was, a, he was um, I think he was kicked out of Harvard, you know, like a lot of people, you know, these more modern business people, it's actually like a resume booster these days to be kicked out of Harvard, right? <laughs> I'm joking, right? Um, but uh, he decided he was going to, dedicate his life to helping solve problems. He's, he ended up on a postage stamp in the US. Um, that with Fuller, and they call him Bucky Fuller for short, he believed in, a, in combining what he called the design science revolution. So Fuller died, he died in the early 80s in like 82, I think it was 81, 82, something like that, maybe 83. But uh, 
throughout the 70s, you can actually, you can go, you can see a lot of his, um, you can go, uh, the to do here is go look at, if you don't know Buckminster Fuller, go watch what, a documentary on YouTube, you know, as put it in one year to do's. Uh, blending, blending design with, uh, you know, things like architecture and evolutionary theory. He created, Buckminster Fuller is actually, there's carbon 60, it's called C60. It's, it's based on fullerenes and fullerenes are in chemistry now. They named these carbon structures, these buckyballs they're called. You see them in playgrounds. This design was quite popular with, you know, with round dome type structures. Uh, they're, they're, the UN has one, I think, outside their, their area. But he, he said, don't fight forces, use them. And for me, that's always been like a mantra in my design work is, how can we harness, you know, just like negative emotions, how, what can that tell us? What can negative emotions, what can this negative experience, what can, what can this experience working with, um, you know, people who don't understand UX, for example, which is a really common challenge. How can you get people to do user research to actually listen to people and pay attention and be evidence-based with their decision-making, just like Steve Jobs was? So you know Steve Jobs, but here I, I want to talk about Steve Jobs in the early 80s, right, and actually late 70s. And you know he's so here's a quote from him. He's he basically says, you know, he's 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 selling. This is early 80s of Steve Jobs in pitch mode. He's pitching his heart out, and he's basically making this an anal analogy. But where did he get this from? He got this from uh, Jeff Raskin, who was a, a usability pioneer and who brought user testing to Apple in 1978, 79. So by 1980, Steve Jobs was seeing user tests and actually going, oh my God, we need to make this thing user friendly. He was getting killed. Apple was, you know, Microsoft had their lunch um, uh, in this market and that happened all the way up till the, the devices. Uh, and bear in mind, it wasn't the PC, it wasn't the, the Macs that made money for Apple. And this is a this is a generation of these devices. It it was the it was the iPad, I, iPhone, iPod Touch, iPhone. I you get the drill, right? You own them. I'm sure multiples of them. Some of you. Um, it was those devices, and still even today, the reason people use MacBooks is because of the trust from their devices. It, to be clear. It's not because the the Mac Macs are Mac operating system is still very technical, you know, uh, and both the, all the operating systems. By the way, if you're looking for a big problem to solve, OS usability is notoriously broken, just like social media is completely broken. You know, thank you Facebook for the extended lesson in broken social networking design, um, you know, doesn't get you closer. I just saw a study this morning that shows that it makes you lonelier the more you're on social media. I noticed with this crisis, I've been trying to stay off Facebook and have done a good job with it. And with the crisis, I found myself on Facebook again for, you know, first two weeks. And then I realized, then I found myself getting sucked in and I pulled back and went, whoa. And I heard friends, a friend who uses it hundred times a day, she was complaining about how she was angry and, and feeling lonely and isolated from the comments on Facebook. And I was like, oh, reminder, right? Now, did, Steve Jobs said this, this great quote about, you know, it's how it works, it's not how it looks. And so that's our, you know, intention with, with UX design and, and all good design really. But a quick story about that, the one on the left there, the Apple IIe, um, 1982, I'm a kid in Minnesota and Steve Jobs decides that he's going to give Minnesota they, they, a, a free computers, free Apple computers in all the schools in Minnesota. And Josh, that's from Minnesota too. I'm sure you had the exact same experience, Josh, with with um, with with computers. Um, that um, uh, that's why I'm here today. It's because of Steve Jobs taking this the crisis. And by the way, you look, want to look at virus crises. HIV was killing millions of people during the 80s. Uh, multiple millions worldwide since uh, since the last 10 years or so. It's it's up there in the 50s million, something like that. That's a huge number. Um, but in his industry, he had this crisis of how do I sell this machine? Okay, make it user friendly and you know partner in education. So he created a whole generation of kids like me who learned. I had computer science classes in every single level of education, and I had great 
computer science teachers, and that's the only reason I have an interest in computers, I swear. <laughs> You know, somehow there's this quote from Steve Jobs. It's as if he's here today, but this is kind of a freaky quote. There's something much bigger than any of us are aware of. Let me take you to Jacques Fresco. If you don't know Jacques Fresco, that's one of your to-do items is go to Jacques, Google Jacques Fresco. There's, he's actually got four or five documentaries on his website. He died a few years ago. I think he was 102 years old. A lot of people don't know that Jacques Fresco was actually a usability, had a usability background. Human factors is the kind of technical term, what they call ergonomics in Europe. But if you don't know Jacques Fresco, you need to get to know his work because he mapped out everything uh, that uh, needs to be fixed. I mean, pretty much everything. Uh, and the thing that's interesting that I love about Jacques Fresco, and I've been following, followed his work for years, was he tackles the social design, the social system design, and the economic system. That's very, very, you know, this is, and, and he did that, by the way, in the period when that was not popular to talk about, when monetarism was coming into the 1980s and, and 90s, when free market kind of monetarism was the, was the standard, you could not question that. And as a designer, you're not going to create things that push up against that. I mean, Steve Jobs thought he was creating something different because the invention of the computer was a way to like help you empower people and he stuck to that he stuck to that vision and those values and that's how he ended up in education empower kids students you know let me talk a little bit more about Jacques Fresco the thing that the important thing to notice about Fresco is re-examination of our values and the very nature of what it means to be human I mean that's a really nice big design challenge kind of perfect for COVID-19 reflection right the back of your mind in between all your other zoom meetings and all your other work that you're doing is you know what is broken and what needs fixed because if this is the opportunity to do that i love how he said that it's going to take the redesign of our culture and values you know and that those are huge problems those are huge problems in organizations if you're designing and developing a center of excellence or designing um, better competency with your team that that's a huge thing too right so let's go to some skills for boosting your mental game which i i you know i did some work with nike golf helping with a community site many years ago and one of the things that i love from golf is this idea of it's the mental game in golf and so with with design it is too i think we need to start by reevaluating everything a lot of experts say get a routine you know here's things that i do at home um, you know, and and trying to do trying to learn more of, um, but what happens when you break those routines is what we like to ask in UX. You know, if you haven't looked into broken tasks, look at broken tasks and trigger tasks. If you're if you do UX work and you you do user research or you you know you design for tasks, that's a little technical to do there for you. But think of how things have changed in all these areas: work, home, public, private spaces. There's a great piece of work that was done uh, by Moravian in the 1970s, this uh, academic in California. His book was called Public Spaces, Private Spaces. And he, he did research on the, you know, what's going on in, those, in our public and private spaces. Well, this is, this is an interesting time now that we're all isolated and quarantined at home to examine that you know, opportunity, the, the balance that exists between there schedules what is time weekends you know it's like you got to watch you don't go to the rolling weekend and work all weekend and you know screen time some a lot of people are trying to get away from you know device addiction and social media and all of a sudden now we're to, to using it to stay informed and you know uh, and uh, the, the idea of closeness the idea of collaborating you know like I said with VR it's kind of broken right one of the techniques that IDEO uses for hiring is, is called it it's called a t-shape i shape and x shape and the question is which one of you of these are you the t-shape what this means is the top of the t that's showing right there that is um, uh, meaning your um, uh, your 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 ability to cross multiple disciplines and multiple uh, you know ideas if you will like different like uh, different ways of thinking and so people that are that are T-shaped, 
um, that have that breadth are going to be able to be open more and work, collaborate with other people across the organization. And the, the one that goes down, like the I shape, that's that's a, a what your expertise is. So you're open and interested at the top to many different ideas and things, and then you also have some specialization. The I shape is you just have the specialization, and you you know you you don't you can't you can't it's hard for you to work with other other people. So this is a tool that's used in hiring, but I think you can use it as well in terms of developing your you know skill set and your 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 abilities is um, you know. Uh, in, in which one identify which one of these you are now x is like more like a manager kind of crosses both and is able to kind of generalize but is able to kind of uh, take a step back manage complex situations and people and usually x-shaped people make better managers than i-shaped people and the t-shaped people make better designers or or experienced designers than i-shaped people you know for example um, so which one of these are you? Let me let me throw up a poll here and um, see if you're still awake. There you go. Which one of those are you? I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it. Sorry, quick on the draw there, but uh, so. Mostly T-shaped people and some managers. I'm like, no, I shape people and some not, not sure. You know, I think it may be a bit of a lie because our education system, as uh, Buckminster Fuller showed us, creates I shape people. You actually are meant to be, even there is a very popular UX certification by one of the leading uh, UX companies. And the certifications are so specialized, UX certification. They're so specialized. You can get like a UX, you know, on mobile. That's it's not going to help you. You want to be a generalist. You want to learn about VR design. You want to learn about service design. Even if you're not using those things, you're like, I'm a UX designer. I'm a designer. I work in a corporate. I'm working a nonprofit. I, I work in an academic environment. I don't need service design. There's so much crossover and so much to learn. And that's just inside of our discipline. So I see people all the time sticking to like you know what they know and so that's that's you need to break those boundaries start by observing you know look at the contrast there's so many contrasts look at the paradoxes like i talked about what's broken and what's you know not and um, find out how you can leverage that there's the mental pivot too which is adjusting to difference and i think you just need to adopt that skill set of it's okay that it's different it's okay that you're uncertain uncomfortable or grieving or whatever you know you felt and are feeling and maybe will feel uh, how can you utilize that uncertainty how can you explore it how can you use it to 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 recheck in you know how can you take a, a systemic holistic historical kind of view these are pivots i think that are vital for your mental game as a designer think about the new boundaries like let's look at these new rules that are developing with supermarkets or how do you talk to people i there was a there was a, a discussion uh, based on an article about the redesign of public spaces and sidewalks in New York City, for example, it's too condensed and how you do social distancing on a sidewalk. How do designers think about that? You know, uh, supermarkets, retail, you know, you can't go and browse and walk around. Now all of a sudden you have to go in and get the thing. And how is that going to change how we market products or how we communicate them? Uh, I think it's important to honor this experience as well and create new things from it and, and find the silver lining in it as well. Um, and, you know, be that 10%. That's what I want you to be is that 10% that bounces back even fresher. And when people go, oh, COVID-19, what a nightmare. You go, yeah. And you go, but uh, there was a lot that I took away during that period. And it was like an extended meditation. I think some of the key skills are acceptance. You know, we have to accept business rules all the time as UX designers. We can't just run ahead and create cool things. They have to be cool within a business context. We have to listen. We have to work with other people from different departments who don't value what we're talking about. They don't, they're not comfortable with qualitative research. We have to verify and validate all the time in UX and collaborate. You know, in, in brain science, there's this concept of neuroplasticity it's it's a thing your brain stays flexible until you're 100 years old you don't 
you don't lose brain function when you age. Don't, don't believe that. It's not actually biologically true. There are certain things that you might do as you age that contribute to your brain deteriorating. But so there's change happening and we need to see what's happening with our users because their change to this coming out of COVID, you know, new behaviors, new systems, maybe new societies. I don't know. Let's go to the tools. So that's your, that's your uh, inspiration. Um, whoops, I think I may have blocked the last few the last few slides there. Sorry about that. Um, so I think maybe around there. Tools you can use. There's first three tools. One is the how might we. The second one is a fake ad, and it's like pacing into the future. And the third one is future state journey mapping. So how how might we cards are used as as a way to kind of brainstorm and imagine possibility. And basically what you do is you create a question or something provocative, um, like how might we, it's, so you put it in the corner, HMW, and then you write down, so how might we create appropriate social distancing in supermarkets, as an example, right? Um, things that you might want to do, and this, this comes from uh, Stanford's D School, by the way, uh, where design thinking was developed um, uh, out of uh, in collaboration with uh, one of the founders of IDEO is where it came from. And it's essentially what we call human-centered, user-centered design, but with some additional kind of lenses and techniques, um, and the, which is, you know, research, check in with your users, prototype quickly, and test. Those, those, that's the recipe to design thinking and to human-centered design. Some tips here, focus on emotions, explore the opposites, and uh, use... Uh, flip your assumptions and analogies and, and focus in on them. So you, just a different way to, and this is a technique we actually use in workshops. So this is not just like some thing, but um, here's, here's more, um, I imagine you've got an ice cream business and you have the insight that licking someone else's ice cream cone is more tender than a hog. So then you might create questions like these. Um, how, I, how might we, we make solitary confinement ice cream? I mean, these are hilarious, but they seem in this, very strange time of COVID-19, they seem kind of appropriate. So use how might we, and you can learn more about that uh, online. You'll find a lot of information. The other one is the fake ad. So the fake ad is, is a way to, when you start your project and you start a design of a product is create the ad for it. What's the Twitter Twitter you know headline? What, what are users gonna feel? What's the, uh, you know, put it almost like the advertisement of what you want the product to be. And then that's even before you even start designing it. So um, this is a, a, a template from Futurist uh, in, uh, I think they're in Sweden. And uh, you, you can create your own though. It's essentially just the idea. You'll find lots of templates, I think, online for this one as well. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about journey maps. A lot of people map their current journey, but to map your future journey, uh, can tell you like what your customers need uh, as the ideal. So what's the kind of way that you can kind of optimize your experience and differentiate it? And I think only 25% of companies from surveys I've seen do future state journey mapping. Most of them do current state, you know, like what's happening now and what's broken and how can we repair it? Uh, so future state journey mapping is actually really, really appropriate as an innovation technique and something that you should be doing. And uh, this is a way for you to kind of understand how you can generate value and give users what they really want and really reassess the best way to engage your customers. Totally appropriate right now with uh, coming out of COVID-19, uh, you know, and, and beyond and that any other crisis or any other, you know, uh, issue that comes up is how do you, how do customers feel about that? What do you need to know in terms of your customer experience? There's a comment made here about, um, not going into too much detail, right? It's, uh, with those knowing, in other words, it's scoping your future state. So it's not like this crazy, like, you know, Jacques Fresco is like designed like cities and social systems and really taking a big, deep drink. You know, in, the, in this case, you may need to scope it. So there are, there's a tool I wanna introduce you to here, five more tools. The first one, it's zoom in, zoom out. We're gonna talk about life cycles, failure mode analysis, ecosystem mapping and systems thinking. Now I'm gonna touch upon these Kind of briefly, my, the point isn't to like introduce you to all these today, like to, to teach you these tools, but just to share them with you as tools that I feel are really appropriate for understanding the time we're in right now. 
and that you can maybe use mentally, you can use them with projects you're working on, and hopefully after COVID, some of them will be really vital. Zoom in, zoom out is just where you're, uh, frame, how you're framing something. So are you too close to the details? Are you out? Are you too wide or too much detail? And you can just say, hey, let's zoom out and look at this from a bigger perspective. Now, the point here is to get the context when you zoom out. What's this an example of? You know, what's, what's COVID-19 an example of, for example? What's, or what's our product when we design our product? What, 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 is, what are we trying to do? What's the strategy? What are, what are, we, what are the underlying goals and truths? Um, the, the details is, you know, what's this an example of um, that, um, you know, what, what are we designing? So when you get down on the, into the details, and the point is to zoom in and zoom out of that as a way to um, get a, a vantage point to, to think about and see where the problem or the question needs to be asked. Where should you take action? Maybe step back a minute and see what are we trying to do, or maybe get closer and like get down in the details. Zoom in, zoom out is actually a technique that's used in service design when you zoom in and zoom out on your service blueprints. And you can do it with journey mapping, but you can use it at all times. And even just in the way you think, this is a book by um, Rasa Beth Cantor at, at Harvard. She studied this topic for many, many years, actually, in leadership. She's talking about how you, you, how you use your mind and at what level. Some, I talked to some people, they look at user experience and they're right down in the weeds. A lot of engineering centric organizations will get down right in the weeds and sometimes you need to take a step back you know step up zoom out um, you don't want to be too zoomed out though you want to be right at that level that makes sense for the problem you're trying to solve but it is important to know which one you're doing some signs if you're too close in you know you don't have the purpose the context um, you know is it going to fit within our goals you know are there similar situations if you're too far out um, you might, um, you know, veer away from the specific problem in favor of generalizations. Um, you might, uh, you know, need the whole, like, encyclopedia, all the details in order to, to move on. And that's an important thing. You know, if your if you're engineering team that you're working with, for example, needs all the details of all the user stories, give, give it to them. If they don't, if you're presenting to executives, they're going to need to pull back and look at, hey, what, what's, what's this data telling us? What's going on? So these are just some suggestions that, um, uh, that Rasa Beth uh, recommends from the work that she did. Um, I like this last one. What, what are the details that make things different or that make things matter? Um, a really important question. And that's, that's down in the details, right? Because it, it does come down to those like very polished details when it comes to UX, you know? So zooming out, like just for me, I found even asking company mission, business objectives, what's the problem we're trying to solve? What's the value prop? What's the business model? These questions sometimes are so powerful that organizations I, that I've worked with and have had this happen dozens of times, they're like, wow, we haven't even started the work. And they're like, wow, we didn't even ask those questions before. Uh, you know, and of course, how will you measure success being also very critical? Let's go to our next tool. Our next tool actually comes, there's an established practice uh, called life cycle analysis. And life cycle analysis, um, or LCA as it's known as, it's used in the, to assess like upstream, downstream, you know, it's used in the, um, uh, uh, like manufacturing, but, but in a way to gauge, engage sustainability. Daniel Goleman uh, mentioned it in his book. This is a great book, by the way, it's called Ecological Intelligence. Um, but basically, it's the, the important point from a design and UX design perspective is that um, there may be unintended consequences to something that you're designing. For example, the guy who wrote the book Hooked, um, he wrote the book Hooked about how to make habitual and almost addictive experiences. That's a really bad book. <laughs> I wouldn't even recommend it because we, that's not, it's not holistic. It's not, look at Facebook's in trouble. They've been in trouble for a few years for creating these addictive experiences, they even research that and manipulate that and things like that. Um, but the unintended consequences might pop up. And I think we have to start thinking about that. We have to, you know, even from a, a, um, uh, a sustainability perspective, you know, so the, the steps here are to, you know, you choose a product, define the boundary. So you scope it, you know, what do you, what's your level of zoom? Uh, then you do an inventory analysis. Um, 
of them, quantify, you know, what's going on, what's being consumed, look at the impact, you know, what are the downstream results of that? And again, this comes from the environmental um, analysis of, say, like manufacturing processes that I think going into the future, we're, we're going to have to do more of this. It's already required in many products, but in some brands like a, a brand icebreaker that we worked with, uh, it's part of their sustainability story of their merino wool, you know, for example. Uh, so the, the final one is using value judgments to assess or decide, you know, if it's, if it's uh, you know, uh, causing a problem or not, right? So, okay, LCA, that's a really, it's a really, it's an established framework. We can start using LCA or, or modifying it or even taking it on board in terms of designs that we do. What's the downstream impact? Let's go to a more common one, which is FMA. So failure mode analysis is taught in, in engineer, mechanical engineering courses. If you do MechEng, you're taught, you're usually taught FMA. And F, FMA is, you know, there people have designed stuff without thinking about their users and, and they've, they've caused problems over the centuries. Bridges collapse, you know, uh, systems go down. Uh, even, even with a healthcare system and the response, look how we're seeing like the, you know, the, the breakdown of that. There's so much material there, right? Um, but for me, it's not just like people say fail fast and that's like a, a buzzword, but I like the idea of feedback, feedback instead of failure, right? That you can do something. The word failure has a lot of negativity associated. You know, a lot of people feel bad, but feed, feedback is past focused. Feed forward is more future focused. You know, if you use that term in that way, you know, as a feed forward system. So feed forward, what's the feed forward, right? Um, I like to say there's no user errors or only, only designer errors and basically realize that, that people are going to fail. So if you know people are going to fail because people are not technically oriented, then design the system around that. So this is what FMA looks like. You first def define the failure mode. So what could happen? What could go wrong? Define the cause. Uh, then identify the effects of the failure. What effects does it have on the user, for example? What can you do to fix it? Corrective action. And that's it. And there's a template there, um, failure mode, cause, effects, and co correction. You can also Google this and learn more about it's, it. It's, it's, I'm not inventing these tools. They're already established. Uh, you know, like I said, this is taught in mechanical engineering degrees. For some reason, they don't teach it in, in uh, UX <laughs> degrees. But you, if you do usability analysis, you end up with it, you know. So let's go to ecosystem mapping. Uh, we live in ecosystems. We can see that now in the world we live in that we're so interconnected. Uh, this is a Nokia CEO kind of going, oh my God, they're, they, we can have our whole ecosystem stolen. Ecosystems, the way we define them, it's the um, employees, suppliers, contractors, uh, and for example, the roles, but also the information, the things they're doing, the services, the channels, devices, databases, the dependencies between all these things, that's what that's how I'm defining an ecosystem. Uh, not so much the users or whatever, but but more the behind the scenes. This is an example of an ecosystem map. So you want to map out you know you, what you currently have. Now we've seen this, this is actually a COVID-19. This is a resource map being used by a city, and they've actually plotted all their resources on here. Um, the key is to understand what you've got and what are the interrelationships and what are the breakpoints between those. So ecosystem mapping is very relevant right now, but it's also something, I mean, um, you know, one of my one of my colleagues, Kendra Schimmel, she, when she was at Capital One a few years ago, she her title was ecosystem director. And she was part of that UX team that Capital One uh, created that from the adaptive path acquisition that they did, which is a UX firm that Capital One, the big bank in America, they, they um, uh, took bought this UX team and took it on board. But to show you how how a bank, a traditional bank that doesn't really you know value UX, how they are able to incorporate that. Also, you have a job title of ecosystem design design de, design director of ecosystem. I think it was. What are all these interrelationships? What do you have that you can leverage, and what where are the where are the flows, the information flows between these systems? Now you can do this as a group. Um, you basically draw a map. Uh, 
you know, you present it uh, to the group, post it on the wall, and and then use it use it as a way to um, help guide your journey mapping or your service blueprinting if you're if you do that as part of service design. But um, doing this with a group is much more powerful than just doing it by yourself, just like journey mapping. Finally, we get to systems thinking. So it, systems thinking is required, I think, for um, for service design. But I think systems thinking, I since I discovered systems thinking, you know, maybe 15, 17 years ago, it, it's guided, I, I think, almost every aspect of my thought process. Uh, that uh, the way, you know, so it's essentially, um, you, you want to look at things from these four different levels. The event level, like what's the perception, you know, of the problem. The pattern level, what are the trends coming out of it. Uh, the underlying structural level, like what's the root cause? Many, many of you know the technique root cause analysis, but that's where, where you might apply that as well. And then the mental model level that, like we don't know the mental model level of the user experience for someone using a, a COVID-19 or post-COVID-19 product. We're just guess. we have no idea, you know. Uh, we don't know what those perceptions and those reactions, those expectations are gonna be. And I think that's why it's gonna be important to pay attention capture those and go with them. I actually saw an e-commerce brand this morning that did get this and was like, it, it, the top of their website is a business as unusual. And, and, you know, and it went into how they were delivering and how they were helping the, uh, um, this is a British brand, how they're helping the National Health Service and, uh, and, and you know, sharing um, resources for kids and stuff. And that was on an e-commerce, big, big e-commerce brand. So some people are getting it. I've got eight more tools for you if you're interested um, from SDFY, Stop Designing for Yesterday. Some of, if you look at these canvases, some of them are the tools that I shared with you. I, I just discovered this when I was putting this course together. There's also um, transition design. So transition design is a Carnegie Mellon University uh, program. If you're interested in the, um, I'll just move that back. So big problems and a lot of them are related to like what we've talked about here today, but um, wicked problem resolution, they call it. And this, this is in academia right now, uh, but I believe it's a, a very uh, important and rich source of, of um, you know, if you're looking to kind of take this to the next level or you're looking to tackle, you know, some of these bigger kind of so-called wicked problems in these transitional times that we live in. So thank you so much, you guys, for, your awesome attention and let's go to some questions. I, I, I've packed a lot in here, I know, but uh, I hope it uh, was useful for you and uh, quick quick poll there for you. Let's, uh, let's go to Q&A if you have any questions. Hi there. Uh, thanks, Frank. Um, those were some very thought-provoking observations, and you've given us a lot to think about. Um, I do have a question to start us off here. Okay, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think for a lot of us, this experience has challenged some of our mental models pretty deeply. Um, and while our solutions um, haven't always been perfect, especially as you pointed out um, with regard to video conferencing tools, for example. Uh, we've gotten a glimpse of how uh, work, education, product distribution, just to name a few things, um, could be very different than a lot of us had previously assumed. Um, do you see particular areas of opportunity where we can think about applying the principles of designer theory socially? Yeah, in fact, there's a there's a whole area of, uh, you know, in addition to transition design, uh, which tackles tackles a lot of those those similar issues. There's social social design. So, so social design is is kind of that you can you can Google that and look more up at that particular topic. Um, there's also sustainability or designing for sustainability. There's there's a whole body of existing like almost heuristics and rules of thumb. Uh, it's also similar to universal design, you designing for you know users for disabilities and then design for for anyone that may also benefit from those users with disabilities. But I think it, it's it's an interesting one because it's one of the toughest social design is one of the, the toughest ones to design for 
um, because of the it, cre it requires so much so many kind of conditions and context alignment for it to work uh, but i'll give you a really basic example from a commercial like a fast food you know, uh, industry kfc uh, and taco bell when kfc kfc and taco bell are kind of these junky restaurant fast food restaurants in america they really are like bottom of the, I think they are, I mean, obviously that's my personal opinion, but I, I'm a vegetarian as well. Um, but, uh, um, so I, I don't visit them, but K KFC and uh, Taco Bell in China, uh, for example, are like luxury restaurants. They even, they even serve booze in the Taco Bell. It's like, well, it's like a nightclub and um, it, there's like a bar and it's, it's a totally different uh, kind of experience. And the point there about social design is China is a very, uh, you know, uh, kind of collectivist, very social culture. The conditions there on the ground, the expectation is that you don't just get, fast food is like a treat, you know, so you don't just get fast food. You also, you know, use it as a social uh, opportunity. It's like a bar, you go to Taco Bell to have some drinks and. Then you buy the food, you know, as, as a snack with your with your booze, you know, with your drinks. So you, you wouldn't do that in America because in America it's just totally different social conditions, you know, as a brand. So that's a that's a kind of localization strategy example of using social design. But then there are more, more serious, uh, you know, issues. And there's a great book called Design Like You Give a Damn, which has a lot of examples in it. It's called Design Like You Give a Damn. That's the name of the book. And has lots of examples of like product designs that can help with in developing emerging uh, economies and how, how uh, to use human-centered design processes to create um, uh, designs that actually, you know, uh, like literally give people, you know, like we're sitting here in lockdown with TV and Wi-Fi with our screens and our Wi-Fi invented by these women I shared with you today. But uh, there are, there are people that don't have homes. There are people in occupied, you know, like land and war zones that uh, are, you know, experiencing COVID-19. What, what's that experience like? You know, what's it like to be, you know, refuge, a refugee? And uh, if you're homeless, I mean, even you don't, don't even need refugees, just someone that doesn't have a, a house that's houseless that's uh, in your area, you know? So there, there are many, many opportunities to apply social design to those kinds of situations, which, and, and badly needed, I might add. Um, so, um, let, did you, um, have another question there, uh, Josh? Or yeah, I do. Um, you, towards the middle of your talk, you referenced, um, the Buckminster Fuller quote, uh, don't fight forces, use them. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of us may perceive some, uh, new and threatening forces in the world today. Uh, things that might be discouraging or even frightening to us. Um, are there perhaps ways that we can use even some of those threatening forces uh, for positive action in your view? Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, Buck Minister Fuller actually said that we need to just get honest about everything. And he meant like history about like really how we arrived to this situation. It's a, it's a little bit like the reaction, like you see, you see um, uh, Donald Trump's reaction to COVID uh, 19 has, is very, most instructive, you know, in in the sense of that kind of denial. And he was saying, oh, it's going to open. We're going to roll, you know, have Easter eggs, and the Easter Bunny is going to come, and it'll just go away, and things, you know. Um, so Buck Minister Fuller said, you know, uh, just you know, be starting by being honest and being open, and and you know, with with UX design process, we do that. We start with what is the, what is the user? How is the user defining their problems? You know, not this feature that we're trying to solve that. Um, and so we use user research and kind of almost like empathy and actual data, users, actual real stories from users. We use that as a way to um, help soften those forces, those forces of, let's say, forces of ignorance, you know, um, and that's a way that, that we do that in the UX design profession. We also use um, one of the one of the ways that UX designers operate is we remove ourselves from the fight of, you know, that. The, the, you know, so we use existing, we say, we're not going to tell you what is a good um, design. We're going to create a quick, quick prototype, a throwaway prototype, and we're going to test it with users and bring users 
into the um, uh, to have that have it come from them. And so we use we use the, the the actual users, the recipients of designs, as a way to. So that's an example of utilizing those forces. Um, you know, I, I think another one too is like I mean the whole point of this of this webinar that I'm doing is that I think we should utilize this these weird times, these weird pressures and uncertainties and and unknowns, uh, we should use them to re-examine our own lives, our own processes, our own organizations, and our own world, our, you know, and and find uh, ways to make uh, things better. And yeah, you mentioned the crappy, you know, video conferencing solutions that I think exist today um, that uh, because they don't get collaborative experience they don't get you know the the online learning tools are miserable they're notoriously miserable uh, you know I, my daughter did online learning when she was in high school for a little bit she was actually sick that was a crisis it was it lasted almost a year uh, with mono what we call uh, mononucleosis and and uh she had to do homeschooling and the, the, she hates homeschooling now even though she's in university now and she has to do homes she has to do online and she hates it because the experiences she had were just so, and that, that was the height of these softwares, by the way. They, that was the, the peak of them being like mature. That was, and this is just a few years ago. This is not, this is not uh, um, you know, 10 years ago or something. Uh, but uh, so this is current information that these, that yes, no, so many things suck. Operating systems, social networking. We shouldn't accept these tiny little things, um, but we should leverage what we know about them and build on them, you know. So, like sidewalks, um, the smart, uh, the uh, making social distancing sidewalks in public uh, spaces design, right? Well, what do we know about already? What are existing forces? We know, like, there, when you drive, there's a speed limit thing, and it tells you that you're going over the speed limit. So maybe we use that concept that people, if you give people feedback, hey, hey, you're more than six feet apart. You know, you need two meters. You need to, you know, get get some space. Maybe they're, it's a gentle, usable, good user, good experience instead of a punitive, authoritarian. You know, um, we have to be really careful. We, 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 governments don't understand technology, and they certainly don't understand user experience. That's been proven over and over. Even Obama, he had a user experience director that he used for his campaign. And um, after the campaign, he got rid of the role and ended up falling on his sword with his Obamacare, his flagship policy. Was a disaster. People couldn't enroll. They it was you know it, you couldn't enroll for like two or three months. It took six months I think for them to fix it. it was a, when he launched it, it was a complete disaster because he outsourced it and the company did um, uh, you know didn't do UX or proper um, testing. And um, yeah, so it, you know what do we know already about behaviors and how can we leverage those you know behaviors, those routines that users have? How can we take those and uh, leverage them. So yeah, that's great. Those are great questions. Thanks for those. Let, let me go to some questions here from the group. If you have any questions, um, we'll stay on maybe for a couple more minutes, but uh, can the presentation be shared? Yeah, yes, we'll, I'll send you a recording to that, to the presentation and um, uh, no problem. So Brad's asking, what are your thoughts on the future of emotion when Masks cover the mouth. Is COVID-19 going to change the way we express emotions? <laughs> there's a there's a curveball of a question. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I think, and then I'm going to zoom out if we can zoom out of that question for a minute and say, when are we communicating? Why are we communicating? With whom are we communicating? Obviously, if it's a loved one, we might remove the mask. Maybe we have transparent masks. Uh, maybe we have, um, you know, safe kind of booths that we can, you know how you have booths at the office for speed meetings? You have like a little phone booth and you can sit in there and there's a tiny table. I don't know if you've, you've seen that or heard of that before, but a lot of companies have them and it's a way to focus the meeting's attention and get people to like, you know, um, so you can have, you know, like that kind of Maybe maybe it's a safe place where maybe it's not safe to 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 talk to to talk now. To use your mask, or you know, um, you know, I, I don't know. It's an interesting question, but uh, yeah, what what are you know? How do we communicate emotions? I, I'm concerned that we we uh, we end up uh, creating rules 
you know, because systems, if you if you don't take a systems thinking perspective, you and and you're you're um, you're just trying to push out a policy or procedure, you may forget about the experience, how that experience is, and it may just be terrible to walk down the street. You know, like I've noticed people like looking away and not wanting to. You know, it's already bad enough that people are hiding on their phones. So we already the problem already exists. The problem's already there with social isolation. How do you break that? How, how do you, you know, even more practicals, you sit inside the same room and I've done it with my family on a vacation. You sit in the side, you're in Hawaii on vacation and you're all on your phones and no one's talking to each other. So how do we express emotion in that way? We, we, it's, it's broken, it's lost, you know? So that's what I mean like by redefining is like, look at where we are and you know, the point about using existing forces is like, look look at the existing problems that exist uh, and, and and then how we can enhance. My, my, my concern right now isn't face to face to face because I, I don't that's I don't even have that. I don't have the, the place to play with that, you know, but it's online. And right now we're hearing that um, uh, there's there's fatigue with Zoom fatigue for too many meetings, right? Uh, why can't you put up an avatar that maybe just keep, keeps your emotions and shows you're there, but it's a silhouette of you or something, you know, like a, a, a drawing of you or something, you know, so that you're not always on. So maybe you can sit there and eat, eat, eat your sandwich because you've been on back to back meetings or something. Um, th these tools have a long way to go. Security is definitely one of them. Zoom corrected their security problems. Um, this software I mentioned, GoToWebinar, it just doesn't have any features really. I mean, it's, it's, it's stable, but that's about it. It's completely clueless when it comes to um, providing webinar software that can be engaging, and you know, um, and, and uh, you know, other than the polls, that's a pretty flat way to interact. You know, let's I'm just kind of break it down. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I, I'm focusing on that level right now. Another question on VR: It's a shared experience, immersive experience. That's been what what's been missing is the element. That's been the missing element in this in this wave of VR. Absolutely, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that actually because um, uh, how do we feedback to the industry that this is what users want? Well, um, I, to me, I believe the whole point of VR is not entertainment or not just entertainment. I think we can. We, I think we we proved as humans that we can entertain ourselves, right? COVID nineteen sponsored by Netflix I, is what I was saying in the first week and then I saw somebody say Conf sponsored by Zoom you know you pull off the mask and there's Zoom there's a cartoon going around around that but for me like we need immersive collaborative like that uh, hollow portation uh, stuff that apparently it works and it's at Microsoft Research Labs and why they haven't productized it and why they haven't scaled it out um, I think it it's there's a there I, I think the core problem again looking at at zooming out a little bit, uh, maybe, or maybe zooming in, actually, that the, the you know, or taking a systems perspective, um, the core problem, I think, with why the industry on the issue of how to give feedback to the industry, why they don't get this is it's a, it's values. When you looked at Apple, Apple, which we all love Apple, I'm an Apple user, I'm using everything Apple here today, you know, uh, the, uh, when Apple rolled out ARKit, this is their augmented reality software that we that's a it's a few years old by now, um, and it's great, you know. And, and Google has uh, one as well. But when they rolled that out, the content that they showcased was like it was it was um, uh, sports, uh, it was um, uh, uh, like a like a, a couple couple of games. And uh, it was just, it, it was got, stuff for guys, first of all. So there was a gender lens on it that was like, well, okay. Um, it's like, dude, do they are or something, you know? But it was lacking in creativity and in the values that Apple, um, you know, normally espouses or puts in their ads or, you know, markets to and, and so forth and so on. Um, uh, and it, it, to me, it, it, it showed that uh, there's, there's a, a problem in, in Silicon Valley specifically with, 
with the man, con, manufacturer of these of these systems. Now there are a lot of people that say that social VR and collaborative VR is the killer is the killer app. I know a lot of people that agree with me on that. That the the whole point of VR, the reason why the reason why VR has made its second comeback, and I say that as somebody who got into this whole field of usability in IT because of VR. This is the reason why I'm like interested in this topic. I did my master's degree on the topic. Um, but the the, uh, the 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 whole reason we have it, the whole reason that it's it, that it, it's trying to evolve, the killer app is collaboration. It's to take us beyond the limited of our phones where we get lost in there. Uh, but it has to be done like right that fits humans and it has to be scaled and it can't be, you know, what, what I saw a few years ago in the 2016 to 2018 kind of the high point of the recent wave of VR before it kind of went into this kind of like, it's all about AI now. Um, the thing that I saw with manufacturers is they were just using VR um, as a way to uh, promote um, this category and not really caring that the fact that at Sundance, at Sundance, do you know what the award-winning VR pieces were at Sundance, which is like the cultural, you know, intelligentsia of American society and everybody like loves Sundance. That's where all the creative stuff. So it's not like some, some edge thing. It's mainstream now. It's not like Burning Man or something. It's like Sundance, the top VR pieces given awards year after year after year were all human emotion pieces. They were um, crossing the line, for example, uh, uh, what it was to be to walk across an abortion clinic uh, protest that was not letting a woman get into the clinic. It was um, a police brutality, some cops beating up um, uh, an African-American guy uh, in the piece. You know, it was all these major big kind of um, socially themed kind of pieces. Um, but I actually think that that VR and AR has a place with serious decision making. I think it can help us get up to speed on some of these issues that we're facing, some of these complexities. And because we're really bad at visualizing, we're bad at seeing, hearing, feeling. We, we tend just like with knowledge and that ITIX thing, just like the way we're trained to go down one narrow specialization, we only read books from our, you know, only read UX books, I don't read, no. No, I read everything from every discipline, you know, that, or I'm open to those things and I, I read widely. Um, in, 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 and, and that, that has that's actually, I don't, I don't read a lot of UX books. I need, I have them, but I don't read them <laughs> as I need to admit it. Um, but, um, uh, and, and the reason is because I'm deliberately trying to break that frame. I'm deliberately trying to get out of that. But I, I think that we can use these technologies to help us visualize and to help us take, to zoom in, literally zoom in and zoom out in VR and AR, literally zoom in and zoom, literally jump in, literally, you know, get into the body of a COVID-19 patient, check their vital signs, you know, um, and, you know, uh, I, this is a lot of potential there. Anyway, let's go to another question. Thanks for the, thank you. You got me on my questions that you know I like, I think. Um, you already, so as, as we already use digital emojis to show emotion on social media, yeah. So that's a, that's something to build on for sure. Um, going back to VR for a second, there are some already some heuristics, some guidelines for um, privacy because privacy in social VR is a big, big deal. Uh, you know, and and you can lose people, you can lose user adoption if someone has an experience. They go in, and then it's like you know someone's stalking you. Women have been stalked in VR, you know, and so so you know I, I um. I once thought of it, one of the VR pioneers who's great as uh, Brenda Laurel, and uh, she's like retired now and everything. She's a usability pioneer as well. But her and I were riffing one time about uh, a VR experience called Walk in My Heels. Um, I think that was her term for it, her her naming of the experience. And it was for it was really for uh, um, a sensitivity training to allow men to see what it's like to walk around in women's shoes and how women get sexual harassment, so forth and so on. And uh, um, I pitched the idea to Facebook and some of these uh, companies and I never heard back, <laughs> but it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Um, so the next, the last question that I think we need to wrap is what might be potential new protocols for trust in physical situations? Um, yeah, isn't that, isn't that a good question? You know, um, 
new protocols for trust and physical situations. I mean, they're going to have to follow social distancing. And I think the thing, how do you emotion and people are going to have to, first of all, have information about how they are supposed to act. But I'll tell you the ones that I'm starting to see, like in supermarkets, they put feet on the ground, like so that you know where to stand. So that's, you know, like visual indicators. Um, if we get AR, just to go back to, you know, not, not that AR is going to save our worlds, but it is a tool to help us like visualize, communicate, collaborate, right? It's just a tool if it's done right and if we all get it and it's universal and it's not just a, a geek interest or a gamer's interest, which it is right now. Um, but uh, if we have a tool like some sort of AR enabled glasses, uh, for example, which are privacy compliant, unlike Google Glass, which was a which was a big learning lesson about privacy compliance. Uh, that um, again, being honest about what we know, I remember bringing that up during Google Glass's launch, and I was told nobody agreed with me at that at the time that I was talking to about it. They were just like, "No, that's not what the that's not why it failed." Like right after, no, like and. Uh, um, no, actually, that is why it failed, because <laughs> people if people are creeped out by somebody videotaping them and streaming it, and um, privacy is a huge design issue, and you have a whole area of privacy design that you need to look at existing heuristics. We, we know a lot about privacy uh, in terms of it's one of the most studied things, and it varies culture to culture based on your condition. So this question that you ask, um, Moyana, it's, it's going to depend on your cultural context. China, very different. You know, um, US, very different. Germany, very different. Japan, Korea, India, you know, um, Mozambique. Um, some of you are on from some of these countries already, so thanks for joining. But it's it's going to depend, and I think we, we have to let the user research show us that. That is the spirit of, of UX, is that listen, observe, you know, and um, to use that, use that data as a way to shape. So thank you guys so much. It's been a real pleasure. I absolutely, absolutely am so uh, pleased that uh, you could join. And thank you so much for listening. If you're listening to this from home, you're going, is he ever going to shut up? Um, thank you again. <laughs> thank you so much. Take care. Stay, stay safe. Stay productive. Stay resilient. And keep learning. Thank you.